correction to, to today. Um, there were two fires in Philadelphia about a year apart that involved LODDs, and the one we're going to be talking about today is the, uh, the one in April of 2013 that killed uh, Captain Goodwin uh, in a fall from the roof. So that's the fire we're going to be uh, discussing today. So again, welcome. Uh, this is the fourth Thursday where we uh, talk about the Uniformed Outreach Programs, and once again, we're going to be dealing with the IC to IC program. A little bit of the uh, ground rules we do. There's new videos other than myself and Chief Wilkins that'll be uh, discussing the incident. Uh, the, everybody will be muted. If you have questions or comments, uh, the chat function is open. You can chat directly to me and I'll pass on to Chief Wilkins uh, the questions as they come across. Uh, so feel free to, to chat as, as the uh, program goes along and we'll get those questions to him. A little bit about the programs. So when a line of duty death occurs, uh, department personnel go through a unique range of emotions and only somebody that's been in that position before uh, can relate to what those emotions are. So that's why the fallen firefighters uh, started with these uniformed outreach programs. Uh, started with the Chief to Chief program several years ago, and last year we started development of the Incident Commander to Incident Commander program. Uh, and then uh, as soon as the pandemic lifts, we're going to work on a company officer to company officer program. And the idea is when one of these positions goes through a line of duty death, then we match somebody who's already been through that and had some training in the process uh, to help them through the process. So that's what these programs are all about. I've been very successful and look forward to continue developing them. We're very fortunate today to have Chief uh, Robert Wilkins with us uh, from the Philadelphia Fire Department to talk about the experiences he went through. Uh, Chief Wilkins is a 35 year veteran of the Philadelphia Fire Department. He ser currently serves as a shift commander responsible for fire and ES operations for a daily average of 545 officers and members. He served as a deputy chief for 15 years in field and staff assignments prior to being promoted to assistant chief in 2018 when the civil service position was reinstated by the current fire commission, Madam Teal. Uh, he's got a bachelor of science degree from Philadelphia University and he returned to Philadelphia after four years of military service to fulfill his childhood aspiration to become a firefighter. So Chief Wilkins, welcome today. I appreciate you coming on board. Great, thanks for having me, Chief. I appreciate you getting me up here. Yep. Now, I really appreciate it. Let me uh, start by saying Chief Wilkins has been involved in the inception of this program. Um, back in June, he joined us in Denver when we started this and it been very instrumental and, and a and huge uh, benefit to developing the IC program. So thanks for all your work on this, Chief. Absolutely. A little bit about the fire uh, we're talking about today. The incident occurred on April 6, 2013. While companies were operating in a fire located in a combination commercial and residential property in the Fabric Row section of South Philadelphia. Tragically, Captain Michael Goodwin succumbed to injuries from a fall from the roof of the building. And Mike was uh, promoted to battalion chief after the incident. So, um, Chief, let's start with uh, obviously the most important thing. Tell us a little about fire, fire, Captain Goodwin. Uh, who was he? What do you want people to know about him? Okay. Uh, while we're doing this for you. Okay. Yeah, ch Chief. Uh, Mike, first of all, Mike was the husband of Kelly, the father of Dorothy, and, and Mike Jr. Um, and he's a 29 year vet of the uh, PFD. Mike worked in the, in the busiest companies in the city throughout his career. And when you look at him, even in that picture you're showing there, you see Mike, he just exuded a command presence. That's a picture of him acting out of rank as a battalion chief. Uh, Mike stood about 6'1", 250 pounds. So you knew he was in the room. You knew he was in the area when he was there. Uh, he meant business. He was experienced. He was knowledgeable. And he, he was the go-to guy. He wanted something done. He gave it to Mike and, and he knew that the expectations were going to be met. Now, I didn't know Mike off the job. Uh, we did cross paths several times throughout our careers. Um, uh, even when I got assigned to Division One, Mike was acting in, in Battalion One that day. I got transferred from Division Two to Division One. Mike stopped in. Uh, you know, we chatted it up. We we, we talked about some some uh, programs we were interested in doing together and, and getting completed throughout the uh, division. And, and Mike was all all on board for everything we wanted to do to uh, to make sure the younger uh, members are trained up. Um, so what I did learn about Mike uh, after this incident was uh, quite a bit about his service to his community, uh, to his church. Uh, for example, uh, I learned that Mike would do his windows every, every fall. He'd do his uh, exterior windows. Well, he lived next door to his brother, and his brother wanted his windows done. So Mike did his windows. Then the neighbors saw that they were getting their windows done. So Mike eventually ended up doing everybody's windows every fall in his little section of, of, of his block. Uh, uh, moreover, he was very much involved with his community and the church. I learned that he used his own money to keep his church out of the red. So that's the kind of person you, you know, you're dealing with. You think you know somebody on the job, but unless you deal with them, 
in, in their personal life. You never really know him. And uh, I learned quite a bit about Mike after this incident. He's quite a man. Excellent. Thank you, Chief. Um, let's start with talking. Tell us a little bit about the day of the incident. Okay. So, uh, Chief, I provided you with a few slides, and, and I was able to kind of uh, stitch together a chronology, chronology of uh, events uh, based on our internal report. So I, I you know, I got the, the, the audio tapes, and you know, they're as we both know that they're, uh, you know, they're not 100 verbatim when when you when you read them. It's somebody just transposing what they hear on the radios onto paper, and that's what we're trying to get uh, for our investigation. Uh, so as I going through here, some things were missing, some things that were, were, were accurate, some that weren't, but it was enough to stitch together enough of a, of a program where we could uh, get to the, to the crux of what was going on here. So I provided you with, with some slides and, this, and we mentioned it happened in Fabric Row and Fabric Row in Philadelphia is a four block garment district in the South Philadelphia section. So, uh, you know, it's, it's identified as you see it by the, uh, uh, you know, red uh, banner on the bottom of the street sign there. Um, if you go to the next slide, the next photo just shows us facing north, and that's Fabric Road. That stretches those four blocks. We're looking north uh, on the, from the east side of Fourth Street, and that's what you see. The the, the uh, you know the retailers, wholesalers put out their wares, and and uh, you know folks come down and and, and do uh, you know do their shopping for their for their uh, fabrics and stuff. And there's a lot of deep history to Fabric Row um, that goes back to the, to the early 1900s. So there's a lot of history. I mean, these buildings are old. They've been around for a long time. And, um, you know, that, that's what we were dealing with. So if you shoot to the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to the next slide, this is the, uh, this is the property, in, in, you know, that was involved with a shot from 1964. Um, and I just want everybody to take note a mental note of this slide because it's going to come into play later on in, in the event. So this is the original structure in 1964. You see the, the, the glass uh, windows, you know, exposing the retail space below, the four bays above, which were apartments. But if you look closer, you'll see two distinct entrances on the side. Uh, one, a gentleman standing in the, in the entranceway, and then further west, there's another door. So there's a gentleman there in, in the, uh, right in that first space there under those bays. And as we move farther to his left going west, there's another door toward the end going towards what would be determined to be the Charlie division of, of this job. So what we're looking at right now is the north side of this building, which would be the delta side of the, of the building as, as we move forward in this, uh, in this presentation. So again, we're looking at two distinct properties here. Uh, the three bays where we're above the, the retail space where that gentleman standing, that would be the, the area where they would access those apartments. And that Charlie Division building, uh, there's the entrance to go to that that two-story or, or I'm sorry, three-story property there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you note, uh, you'll even see up on the bays on the top one ornament ornamentation on the top of the bays there, probably right under that that third floor window, you'll see that the squares uh, are different. You know, in in that in, that, in, in the first three they're similar, and that last one is different. So again, these are observations that you know we can make. Uh, you know, now having, you know, in hindsight, these were two separate buildings. Um, but this is going to, um, you know, uh, like I said, play a, a, a very important role in, in our size up later on in this uh, uh, event. So uh, as we, let me see, we can go to the next slide. And that was Mike, uh, Jack B's um, fabrics right up until the, the, the day of the event. That's where it uh, appeared, <clears throat> excuse me, a type three construction, ordinary construction. However, it was converted to four two-story apartments. It was unsprinklered, had an alarm system, and that's situated on the southwest corner of 4th and Fitzwater. And that conversion, without a doubt, uh, uh, was a contributing factor to, uh, to Mike's disorientation on this job. Uh, if we move to the next slide, this is the, the retail space. When you go in these, in these uh, uh, retailers, this is what you're looking at. Um, that's the fuel package in the retail space alone. Uh, so you can imagine what the storage areas look like. And, and this is what you're dealing with for, for four blocks of, of these, uh, these types of uh, uh, businesses. Okay, so that's, uh, <clears throat> that's the lead up. Now, on the day of the event, 
um, 1735 hours, there, were, uh, there was a box dispatch for 4th and 5th Water for 748 South 4th Street. And in Philadelphia, a box for us is uh, four engines, two ladders, two battalion chiefs, a special operations company, which in this case was Rescue One, and a medic unit. Um, our first battalion chief's aide, the first new battalion chief's aide, handles communications. So he's monitoring communications from the Fire Communications Center or the FCC, uh, the fire ground channel, and also the analog channel in case uh, something occurs or somebody loses the channel and needs to operate on the, on the uh, analog channel. So he's, he's, he's here or she is very busy monitoring uh, uh, three channels during the event. So my communications from the fire ground or the incident commander's communications go through the communications uh, officer on the fire ground who's at chief's aid, and then he relays the information back and forth uh, to the FCC. Now, I can't because I'm, I'm, out, I'm removed from the vehicle. I can't hear transmissions that are happening uh, citywide. Uh, so I'm just operating on, a, on a, a, a tactical channel and those are transmissions I hear unless I uh, either have another radio or I move closer to a vehicle. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 1737 Engine 11 arrived on location and they reported light smoke uh, and put one and one in service. One engine, one ladder in service. They were met at the door by the, uh, by the owner, supposedly, he says, I think I got it. Um, well, that wasn't the case. Uh, at at 1743, uh, uh, the initial incident commander, Battalion 4, arrives on location, and he reports medium smoke showing. He puts two and two in service, and uh, that, for us, would be an automatic trigger to, uh, to get a RIT company dispatched, rapid intervention team, which is usually a ladder, uh, another squad company, another SOC company, which in this case was squad 47 and another medic unit. So moving forward, at 1746, Battalion 4 puts all hands in service, and that triggers another dispatch. That's going to hike me out as, as, as a deputy chief, an, EM, an EMS officer, and, uh, and, and, and that, that will fill out the, uh, the actual uh, box assignment. <clears throat> Excuse me, the actual first alarm assignment, I should say. So at 1754, Battalion 4 reported heavy smoke for the first floor. Primary surface in progress, all hands were in service with engine three quarter. So about 1756, I arrived on the fire ground. I approached it from the west. As I said, that, 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 uh, that Delta side, I was able to come down that street, down uh, Fitzwater Street, approaching from the west, uh, going east, which brought me down the, uh, the Delta side and around to the, the front on the alpha side, the front of Jack B's. So as I noted as I was coming up, the Charlie Division was a one-story exposure. Uh, the Delta Division had four sections of bay windows on the you know, second and third floors. Several of them were vented, several weren't. Uh, there was light smoke showing on the second floor and no to light smoke on, on, on sections of the third floor. <clears throat> as I kept walking uh, down the Delta side, uh, you know, there was a Bilko door that accessed the basement. That door was open. Battalion uh, 1 was actually the battalion chief that was watching a company who had accessed the basement through that Bilko door. Uh, there was medium smoke coming out that out of that, uh, that Bilko door. And uh, <clears throat> at that time, I, you know, I told Battalion 1 to, to back the companies out. Um, Moving around to the Alpha Division, it was a three-story brick road type with approximately 20 by 65, a straight-through property uh, where Battalion 4 was at his command post set up in front of the building. He had interior lines and service. It was a storefront. Um, and, you know, it was simple. It was, it was something, you know, uh, typical of, of what we would see, these road type uh, properties. Uh, as I looked at the Bravo division to the, to the left, the immediate left of, of Jack B's, it was a three-story storefront, it was attached, uh, similar construction and dimensions, and the smoke conditions were just worsening. Now, now what the pictures we're looking at here are from the second alarm and, 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 and forward. Uh, so the, the, the smoke conditions were, were uh, worsening, and there was no indication of us making progress, and I was aware that the elapsed time was approaching 20 minutes from the time I was monitoring back at the station from the time the initial dispatch occurred uh, until I got there. So I knew we were approaching uh, 20 minutes. So I, I immediately told Battalion 4 and Battalion 1, let's get all the companies out and we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll transition to an exterior attack. So uh, about 1800, I formally took command. I did a face-to-face -face with Battalion 4. I assigned him to Alpha Division. 
and I assigned, uh, assigned Battalion 1 as Charlie uh, Division, which would be the rear, and Rescue 1 as Roof Division. So shortly thereafter, I raised Battalion 1's aide, who was the second in chief's aide, and told him to identify a staging area because I was going to strike the second alarm, and I was going to assign him as the staging area manager. It was at that time that I made a conscious decision that I was going to put uh, Ladder 27 in service, um, not because I was I was a, a desperate for a company, but I knew I was going to replace them with with another uh, RIP company because I want to utilize Mike's experience and as I mentioned before his his, uh, his his presence on the fire ground and his you know get it done attitude. So uh, he also had a great familiarity with this area, uh, the construction, et cetera, et cetera. So I was going to take advantage of all of that. Um, so about a couple minutes later at 1802, I did a face-to-face -face with Mike to notify, him, to notify him I was going to strike the second and uh, put his company in service after his replacement uh, arrived on the fire ground. Uh, 1803, I ordered a second alarm. I had come to proceed to staging. And at that time, I reassigned uh, Battalion 1 to the Delta side. So he's got the north side of the building. Uh, Battalion 8 would become Bravo Division, and Battalion 7, when he arrived on the fire ground, would be assigned to the Charlie Division. So, about 1805, the second alarm is dispatched, and the second alarm in Philly gives us five engines, two ladders, and four battalion chiefs. Now, that first engine and that first battalion chief, they handle logistics. Uh, those two uh, other chiefs in between, which in this case would be Battalion 8 and Battalion 7, would normally be assigned to a, to a division. And that, uh, that last battalion chief would become the incident safety officer. Also on the second, it's automatic dispatch for our visual communications or VCU to respond. And that's where these, fo uh, these photos came from. And obviously they were time stamps. So I was able to again, align them with this, uh, with this chronology of, of events here. So about 1807, I raised uh, communications to request uh, another writ because I was putting ladder 27 in service. And I distinctly said it should be an engine company uh, all of our firefighters are trained, whether they're assigned to an engine ladder, they're trained in, in rapid intervention team operations, they're familiar with the equipment. And I did that because of the proximity of the next ladder. You know, we, we started, uh, uh, you know, when we strike a couple alarms in Philly, we start struggling with coverage. So the cover up companies kind of stretch our ladders thin. Uh, you know, we try to keep at least one ladder, in, you know, per battalion, you know, uh, uh, you know, optimally it would be two. So I knew that, that there would be a stretch to get a ladder company there quickly. So I asked for an engine company. That kind of got lost in the shuffle we found later on. I did not know that at the time. Um, and, and I can talk about that a little bit as I go further. So in 1809, the second alarm company started arriving on the fire ground. And there was an officer uh, from an engine company that approached me. Uh, and I asked him what his assignment was. And he said to proceed into staging. So I told him, well, go back to staging. Uh, about 1811 or so, I asked uh, communications, as to the communications on the fire ground, who the writ replacement was. Um, so what, what had happened was FCC, the Fire Communications Center, uh, arbitrarily um, made a move to recall the engine company, which was Engine 43, that they dispatched as that writ company that I requested. They returned them and, and, uh, uh, and dispatched a, a ladder company. Um, so again, you know, that was unbeknownst to me. Uh, at 1812, Ladder 4 responded in, in, as, the, uh, as a writ uh, replacement, and that's when the communications aide told that to me. So at that time, I called that officer from, uh, from Engine 49 to come back and to assume the, the writ responsibilities, and I was putting Ladder 27 in the service. So about a minute later, I give a progress report. We have all hands in the service. We're transitioning to an exterior attack. Uh, the roof ventilation is in progress. The collapse zone is established. The second alarm companies are in staging. And the strategy was pretty clear at that time. You know, exposure protection, confinement, extinguishment. It was, it was you know, again, you know, we talked about bread and butter, but this, this was, this was uh, pretty much a straightforward, you know, job. Um, again, you know, based on the fuel package, little to, to no visible fire. Uh, but heavy, heavier and heavier smoke conditions. So about 1815, I did a PAR. Uh, all companies, all, all members were accounted for. And about two minutes later, Mike uh, raises me on the radio and says he's on a Bravo roof. 
he has heavy smoke pushing real good on the Delta side and heavy smoke pushing on the second floors on the, on, on the, uh, went from the windows of the fire building. Now, when he gave me this information, it didn't quite coincide with where visually I would think he'd be able to, to get this information. So, uh, you know, I thought his vantage point from, from the Bravo roof would not be able to, to allow him to, to give me that information. So, uh, I kind of confirmed with him that he was on the, uh, on the Bravo roof. And he said, affirmative, he's looking at the windows of the fire building itself. And he's heavy smoke pushing real hard from all the windows. So I asked him to get a trench cut between the, uh, the Bravo and the original fire building at the point where they're connected up front. As, as you know, in, or may not know in, in road type structures, the, the front areas of the buildings are connected. And then there's a, a, a light shaft down pretty much midway. And then through the back of the, of the, uh, of the buildings, they're separated. So, uh, Mike said he's in the process of doing that now, and then I signed him as Bravo Roof. Uh, about 1818, Mike raised me on the radio and tells me it'd be a good idea to get a line there on the second floor of Bravo Roof, because, Bravo Roof because if the fire comes out of those windows, the Bravo exposure is only about five feet away. Again, I verified that he's on the Bravo Roof. Now, during the post-incident interviews, you know, we discovered that other companies had used ladder 27's ladders to, to, to ladder these properties. So instead of uh, ascending the Bravo roof from the front that we're, that we're looking at there, Mike and his crew went back and, and ascended the, uh, the, the one story uh, exposure in, in the Charlie division uh, because ladders had already been raised up there. So 1821 battalion eight arrives and I assigned him as the Bravo division. Uh, at 1821, shortly thereafter, we get an emergency activation from Rescue One's roof and Ladder 27's roof. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Rescue One roof comes up and reports that we have a man down. He just fell off the roof. Um, now there was so so much confusion there, and again, you know, you know, this presentation is, is sanitized, but you can imagine the confusion. Uh, you know, the the, the emergency activations, uh, uh, pass devices, pass alarms going off. Uh, you know, the, the transmissions are, are garbled in some cases. So, you know, in the aftermath, we, we learned a lot, of, a lot of things, but at this time it was just, you know, a, a matter of, of, you know, no, no shorter than uh, heroism and valor what, 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 uh, what happened thereafter. So a couple of people witnessed might go off the roof. Um, his senior man from the company, uh, at that point took, took matters into his own hands. He ordered all the, the, the members of the, of the Ladder 27 onto their knees and he did a roll call. Uh, you know, it was quick thinking on his part. Um, you know, he accounted for all the members and that's when they realized it was Mike who had fallen off the roof. One of the members from Ladder 27 made his way down to the area where Mike um, had fallen on the roof and, and tried to make a, a rescue, um, you know, and then the other companies that tried to assist him. So about 1822, a rescue one officer comes up. He states the mayday was declared for the member who fell off the roof and he's fallen onto a porch roof. Well, it wasn't a porch roof. It was actually the, the one story storage storage area of that fire building. Um, so 1823, I ordered uh, engine 49 who assumed uh, writ duties. I, I ordered them in the service. And Ladder 27's members and Rescue One members were attempting to get Mike off the roof at that time. And again, one of the members, um, again, just, just the, the, the act of heroism was incredible from, from, from all those folks that were back there. Now, mind you, I can't see any of this. I can't, you know, I don't have a visual of what's going on and it's, it's still confusing to me because I'm just looking at, you know, the, 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 the two sides that I'm, I'm capable of seeing, uh, you know, from my vantage point. Um, so one of those members had, had gotten down to the roof. Uh, he grabbed Mike and, and, and tried to pull Mike, uh, and, 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 and fell off the roof. He made his way back up onto that one story roof, uh, grabbed Mike again and, and just tried to hold on to him and, and use his own body weight to throw himself off the roof with, with Mike in his grasp. That didn't work. And, and the, you know, people that were observing this, they said Mike was, was motionless, you know, during this whole time. So. The subsequently, we, we learned from the, uh, the coroner's report that, that Mike had probably, you know, uh, you know uh, on impact, it, it passed away on impact. So, you know, if there's any uh, 
good part to that is that Mike, you know, didn't suffer through through the the, the heat and smoke, um, and and not being capable capable of, of moving himself. Uh, so subsequently, uh, you know, they radioed to us that the um, that the access point to to get to this is going to be through the Bravo exposure. Now, this is in a courtyard area. This uh, normally would be accessed, obviously, through the through the, through the fire building. It's that storage area, but now our access point is actually a brick wall uh, that Mike is, 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 is going to uh, eventually be on the other side of. So uh, at 1826, uh, the roof division says they're in the process of removing a member from the roof. Um, then it's shortly thereafter, Bravo division chief reports he has a squad company assist to rescue one of the latter 27 members trying to rescue the down member. He has an engine with it, a protective line in place. Um, and again, there's still some confusion about what's going on. So a couple minutes later, he, that chief Bravo division chief comes out and says, he's gonna to talk to me face to face because there's confusion. I kept asking, where is he? I didn't know whether you know he had fallen from the, 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 the third floor roof where I thought it would be. And then again, in the road properties, there's a second floor roof uh, because the third floor doesn't extend fully to, to the rear in some cases. So I thought maybe he fell down there, 10 feet you know, down to, to, to there. So he came out, gave me a face to face and kind of explained to me where Mike what was situated on this. Um, so I assigned him to the, uh, to, to the rescue uh, attempt there. Um, about 1830, the Delta supervisor, uh, Battalion One raised me and he says a, a member from Ladder 27 reported uh, a member down. So I asked him, is this the same member or a second member? And, he's, and his response was, it's the captain. Um, so right after that, I raised a Bravo supervisor. I asked him, do we have two members down now? Um, and he confirms it's just one member. It's the same member. It's the only member. And that, that happens to be Mike. So if we go to uh, uh, the next uh, slide, I guess it would be uh, number six on, on our chart. <clears throat> that's this ladder 27's piece. They're on the, uh, they're, they're, that's where they parked his, his rapid intervention team. So they're uh, on that northwest side of fourth and fitzwater and that's why mike went down the the delta side and and advanced up that that ladder uh that those other companies had, had put up there uh, to access the charlie uh, roof so we can go to the next uh photo so that's the delta side of the building okay the next one and there's a a, a vantage point where i approached from the west and again i saw the, 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 as much of the Charlie side as I could. Uh, I'm thinking that the Charlie exposure is that one story section of that firefighter with the yellow helmet standing in front of, and the fire building is, 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 the, uh, is the original objective there. There's one door there. Uh, now you can see that other door that we showed you in, in photo one is no longer there. And all we have is this one door in, in the, closer to that firefighter's shoulder. Uh, and that's the access point to now access all of those four store or two story four apartments so that that conversion was made and you can see it's a it's a mailbox right there under the arrow that that's it's four mailboxes there but that wall has no structural uh, uh load bearing properties it's a facade and you remember the glass wall that ran down that that property uh, and you can see how the smoke is is venting above those you know right below the bays but if you remember there was an uh, access above those windows you know, that we showed in, in earlier in slide three. Um, okay, so if we go to the next slide. Okay, so that's about uh, 1831 hours from, from the Charlie Delta side of the, of the uh, building. And as you can see, it's a lot of smoke, a lot of smoke pushing. At this time, we still have very little, if, if any, visible fire on the uh, on the, the Delta and Alpha sides of this. Most of this fire is visible uh, from a higher vantage point. There, there was videos of neighbors in, in, in the area with, with their video, and also obviously from the firefighters that were operating in the rear on that third, uh, third floor uh, roof. So in 1832, Bravo requested an engine ladder to assist uh, in the rescue effort. So I you know, got some companies from staging, assigned them to him. If we go to the next slide, so there's Delta. There's the one-story section that Mike and most of the firefighters are operating in the rear. They go up that ladder, 
they raise another ladder. Uh, that's a one-story section, so they raise another ladder to the back side uh, of, of that uh, that bay to access the roof. So again, we're thinking that that roof is is, is one property, um, you know, and it's a straight-through property. What it appears to be from the front. Okay. Uh, next slide. Okay. Let me see. Let me see what that is. Okay, so that's the front of the uh, property. I might have skipped a section here, Ian. Let me see if I can uh, if I can bring mine up here. So that's obviously the alpha side of the building. Um, and the Charlie Delta side is what we're looking at. I'm, I'm sorry, that's the, uh, let me see, that's the alpha side of the building, obviously. And I'm trying to get it locked into to my uh, timeline here. Okay. So if we go to the next slide, Okay, so there's the delta, the, the delta side of the, of the building again. And if I go down to, let me see, and I'm gonna get this, I think I may have gotten out of whack myself here. Okay. Okay, so 12. Okay, so now what we're looking at is about 1840 hours right there. So at, at, at 1836, um, the one story section that Mike was operating on in the rear, a uh, collapse sent him inside that, that building. So 1837, um, Mike uh, is, is, is now uh, you know, going on to the other side of this brick wall that, that I talked about. And if we go back one slide in, um, that's where we can look at, you know, again, uh, Bravo company, uh, Bravo supervisor requested an additional company from staging to assist in the rescue. But again, we're looking at, at, at very little, uh, uh, you know, fire from the front. He, his vantage point is a lot different uh, and showing a different picture than, than what we're showing. So if we go to the next uh, slide there, 1830, 1838, we're down to two engines and 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 uh, and and two ladders in staging. So I strike the third alarm for manpower and place them in staging. So at 1838, what we're looking at now, um, the delta wall buckled and 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 the collapse is imminent there. So remember, there's no load bearing structure on that on that facade over there. If we go to the next slide, you can see where the wall is buckled under that bay. Now we're starting to see some fire uh, venting there under that bay. And if we look at that vertical siding at the top of that brick wall, you can see, come down again, just, just right where the fire is. To the left of that, you can see, yes, right there where that, that, that siding was, that's what's hiding that, uh, you know, that, that glass wall behind it. So again, in hindsight, when we look at this, if you look at those at the building there that where, where the fire's under that bay, you can distinctly see it is two different brick colors from the original fire building and what that conversion was. So they actually opened up those spaces and, 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 and you know, adjoined that property. So these are things that, you know, obviously you miss a lot of cues, a lot of things are happening, but in hindsight, we can see that this is not a, a normal configuration of a, of a road type uh, structure. What this does is essentially turn this into an L-shaped building in, in the rear. Okay, so the next slide. We're just showing advanced fissures in the wall there, uh, the delta side. Okay, collapse is imminent. Uh, so 1855, Bravo requested a medic unit. Remember from ladder 27, it was making an initial attempt to rescue. Uh, Mike uh, suffered uh, uh, second and third degree burns on, on his uh, hands and he's transported to the hospital. So in uh, 1900, our Special Operations Command Deputy Chief arrived on the fire ground. Uh, I gave him a report at the Incident Command Post, a uh, situation report, and I wanted to use his expertise to, uh, you know, so we could, uh, you know, effectively 
make a, 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 a bad situation as, as safe as possible. Um, so about 1901, we have a partial collapse of the original fire building. And, and that's what we're looking at, uh, at here. All right. As we move on to uh, the next slide, again, we're just showing more and more uh, of, of this collapse. And, and now we see that bottom wall where the glass uh, wall was originally, that original structure is now exposed. That this is, you know, that this was certainly two, two different buildings. And we can see that that brick wall is just a facade there. Uh, we can move to the next one. And it shows us the Alpha Delta side in 1903. Again, we're not showing a, a hell of a lot of fire from the front door, at, at any point during this, this, this job. Okay, a couple minutes later, next slide. Same thing. Now you can see it lighting up in the back. As that collapse occurred, it kind of gave us an idea of the magnitude of what was going on in, in the back there. Okay, next slide. Okay, again, that the siding right under the stop sign. Um, you know, we see that that's that siding that, that was just covering up something there. Um, so the next slide. We're fortunate that, that wall is now collapsing down and out because that rescue attempt through all of this, through all this fire uh, fighting effort here and this building collapse, and keep in mind that there's a rescue attempt happening 20 feet away from this in the Bravo courtyard. So, um, okay, the next slide. All right. Okay, so 1916, car two arrives on the fire ground. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And we can go to the next slide for that one. Okay. So he arrives on the fire ground. I do a face to face with him. We can go to the next slide. And we'll see that the majority of, of the buildings collapsed. Again, fortunate that it's down and out and not just, uh, you know, toward that, that rescue effort. So about 1922, I transferred command to, uh, to car two. And I managed to rescue uh, the rescue group at that point. I didn't, I, I distinctly wanted to, uh, to bear the burden of, and didn't want anybody else to bear to make you know, the call because we had several teams operating back there trying to get to Mike uh, under extreme conditions. And, and I certainly didn't want um, you know, somebody else to have to make the call. It was in my mind that we were gonna take Mike out with dignity uh, you know, to, to, you know, to the last minute where we couldn't stand there. So I, I was not consumed or preoccupied with, with that so much that I didn't realize the dangers or, or that was happening around us. But, you know, I certainly, uh, you know, didn't want uh, somebody else to have to bear the burden to say, well, you know, we got to get out of here or we're going to stay in here and then we lose other companies. Um, so about 1928, um, you know, we made the uh, initial breach of the wall where Mike was. Uh, it was generating a lot of smoke. Again, you know, they're, they're, they're hitting the fire, they're knocking the fire down. So it generated a lot of smoke back there. We can't see the guys from the squad company, Rescue One and Ladder 27 and other companies back there did just an amazing job getting to this. They're using their Pac-90 hydraulic tools. We're worried about, you know, things uh, collapsing around us. The, the, the communications was was great. And, and, and to see that, you know, folks stayed disciplined and, 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 and you know, did not get out of their lanes of, of you know, getting involved with something they shouldn't. They, they maintain, you know, the firefighting effort and that's really helped us, you know, become a successful effort to, to, to get Mike. Um, so next slide, you know, we're getting some, some, some fire lighting up all during this thing. Uh, but again, here's the, um, you know, here, here's the, uh, the, the, the retail space up front. Uh, very little fire in front of this building up to the second and third floors. The, those sections weren't affected much. A uh, little exposure to the Bravo, a uh, uh, ex uh, little extension to the Bravo exposure. Um, but again, it was it was nothing, uh, you know, extraordinary about this. It, it might not, you know, uh, plunge, you know, just been another one where we took up and, 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 and went home and, and talked about it later. So about 2100, uh, this is it. We placed the fire under control. Uh, next slide. And, and this is where we were at that point. You know, the fire is, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, contained. 
And uh, next slide. Okay, so that's also on the left. Uh, the companies are lined up on the left. That's about 2110. Uh, uh, we waited to, to get an American flag. Somebody went to retrieve an American flag. We had Mike on the stretcher at this point, and we just wanted to drape Mike with this American flag. And, and the companies, you know, as we said, we brought him out with, with honors. It was, it, you know, it was at no time that, that you know, that, that I want heavy equipment, you know, uh, doing this if we could avoid it. So, you know, the guys hung in there, and I was really pleased with, with the way they did it. And, and like I said before, nothing short of, of, of heroism and valor, you know, throughout this whole thing, man, from, from, from each and every one of them. Uh, so that's it. We brought, the, you know, Mike out with, with honors, and, and that was, that was the, the, uh, the, the day of the event. Okay, so this is the aftermath. This is the next day. Uh, you can see how the, the, the building's affected, you know, structurally in, in the rear. Uh, the Bravo, again, you know, very little exposure or extension to that exposure in, in the front. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. Okay. Okay, next. All right, now when we look at this picture, that, that roof line is the original, and when I say original, we talked about that different color brick building. That's the original Charlie exposure. Those two windows in the rear belong to a straight through property that you entered off the Fitzwater or Delta side uh, of this building and went straight through their property. When they did that conversion, that was now, you know, connected to that, to that other part of the, the L story uh, section of, of the original fire building, the rear of that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so there, there's the one story section that you're looking at. That's how they access the, the roof there. And then they put a ladder up to go to the, to the next level to get up to that third story roof. Now, keep in mind that that rear wall is parallel. Uh, Chief, if you go to the next slide. That wall is parallel in the rear to the Bravo. Now this, this picture obviously doesn't show it. It shows a little skewed because of the angle it's taken. But those two, those four windows are from that, that property we just talked about, that original Charlie uh, uh, property. And what would be next to them going toward the Bravo exposure rear the Bravo, right, exactly. That space in there was also a, a, a two and three story section. That wall had collapsed into the interior of that, of that uh, uh, apartment. So what you're looking at is a section missing. And then when we go to the next slide, you'll see what I'm talking about. So that roof line coming, uh, you know, that, that from this angle, you can see the roof line is parallel going all the way across. Um, next slide, please. Okay. And this just shows again, you know, uh, the, the vantage point from which those photos were taken. And that's why it, it looked a little odd. But when we show this next overhead view, this will clearly show how Mike was, was disoriented. Now you're looking at the, 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 the top of, of these uh, buildings. Now there's Jack B's, right? That's the, the, the property on the end. And that L shape in the back is the property we were talking about. Now, uh, Mike was probably standing someplace close to those stacks in the, in the back there and said he's gonna meet. Now he thinks he's on the Bravo roof, the rear portion already. And if you look at those properties all the way to the, the left co corner of the screen, that's what we're, what we're normally working with. You know, you're at the rear of a, of a property and you see they're joined in the front. So you think you're at the rear, you can walk all the way to the front, uh, you know, from the back. And they're only joined up at the, at the front there. So back to the, the original fire building, Mike's probably somewhere around those stacks there. And he wants to proceed to the front of the B exposure. So as he walks off that roof, going to or towards our right on that screen, going towards the front, towards, uh, yeah, right there, Ian. That's the space. That's the space where Mike stepped off the roof thinking he's going to transition just right across from that one roof. He thinks it's one continuous roof probably, and he's going to walk a straight to get to, uh, to do his trench cut where those buildings join in the front. So Mike falls down in that space, and that space is, uh, uh, again, uh, just a courtyard. You know, it's, it's a one-story roof down there that he fell to. So he fell 20 feet to that, to that rooftop. Uh, and that section that we just talked about, <clears throat> under where he originally was standing, where we showed in the photo before, uh, that section of wall is missing. That section's collapsed into the, into the original fire building. 
So that's what made the, the rescue attempt precarious because we had, you know, obviously collapses around us. Um, you know, there's a freestanding wall there now. And, and our access point was through the Bravo exposure interior out the back, uh, you know, door to the rear. And then we had to breach, uh, breach a, a brick wall uh, to get to Mike. Um, so, so that's it. And I said that that construction itself is what led uh, to, I think, all of our confusion. You know, if you weren't on the roof uh, or, or in this view, I should say, to, to see how this was constructed, you would just think you were dealing with two straight through properties. Um, so, uh, again, just just unimaginable, you know, while, while I'm standing out front with what was actually, you know, visually happening, you know, in, in the rear of this property. Um, so as we move forward and, and, uh, and, you know, you know, unfortunately, you know, uh, you know, business goes on, you know, and, and here's, here's the demo of Jack B's, um, in the next slide, please. Okay. There's a, a year later, I think that's about, uh, uh, 2014 where, where, uh, you know, they're back to doing con construction. They're, they're fixing their properties back up and the next slide. And here's Jack B's today. You know, you never know that a firefighter lost his life there. Um, you know, and, and 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 that's what we have to remember. You know that that uh, you know, as much as we do our remembrances and, and memorials for our fallen, that you know, it's business as usual, and that's why we have to be careful and and you know, stay conscious and, and situationally aware at every point. Um, so that's it, Dean. You know, that that takes the fire right up to 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 the present day. Chief did have one question. Uh, was the wind a factor in this incident at all? No, not at all. It was about six miles an hour. It was a light breeze. Uh, humidity was great. And like I said, it was what we would say in, in, in the business was a great day for a job, you know. Um, yeah, it was not a wind-driven fire. Um, uh, it, it was just, uh, you know, again, you know, it would have been a normal day for us. Uh, normal in the sense that, that we're uh, operating a textile uh, uh, occupancy, but you know, it was, it was, you know, as you see, it was very little extension to, to the other properties. They did a great job with, you know, the firefighting effort. Uh, you know, it was just, it was, it was just so unfortunate. And, and you look back and, and you're like, you know, damn, you know, why, why did this even uh, occur? You know, why, you know, if, if all these series of events didn't occur and didn't occur just because they were uh, taken out of being the rapid intervention team, it could have been another company. It could have been another, we, we could have lost, an entire company, if, if you will. But the series of events that led up to it, that, that the ladders were used, that Mike used at access point, he was assigned to the, the Bravo front. Had he gone up to Bravo front, maybe we would be having this conversation today, who knows. Um, but just the way things unfold in a series of unfortunate events that, that in most cases lead to uh, to our, our line of duty death, you know? Well, thanks for that detailed overview. Got quite a few comments to really appreciate the insight into that, into the operations. So. Anything uh, you want to relay personally, what you were experienced as the incident unfolded? You know, and there was a, a, at one point, there was a lot of confusion. Like I mentioned the, the part about the, uh, about the, 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 the activations and things like that. Um, you know, the, we got the activations, we're getting radio transmissions. Uh, there was confusion about, you know, what was happening, who was down, how many were down. Uh, and, 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 you know, again, when I got the second one, I thought, well, did somebody else walk off the roof? You know, what, what is actually happening here? And that's why when the, the, the division, uh, the Bravo division supervisor said he had to come out and talk to me face to face. And he was actually able to lay out on, on the command board to me what it actually looked like back there. And then it, it brought it kind of in, into a play. I thought it may have been a cardiac event at some point. Could we get a medic unit to this member? You know, what was going on? Initially, there was just confusion about what, what was happening. It's, it's been a little over seven years since the incident. Uh, what do you want today's firefighters to know about it? You've mentioned repeatedly that, you know, you, you, your thought process in this fire was it was a, not necessarily bread and butter, but it was a routine operations, and that's not always the case. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so, again, we see that, you know, Jack Bees is back in business. You know, uh, you know just because a line of duty death uh, occurs, it doesn't stop them, you know, from, from going about business as, as usual. But for us, what we call bread and butter, that, that shouldn't be conflated with routine. You know, it's nothing routine about any job. Keep your head in the game. Uh, the ironic thing about this is that we had, uh, uh, 
a presentation. We all are captains going around in, in division doing presentations for, for engine and ladder operations. And uh, we had a lot of new members coming out. We had a couple of classes graduate in, in, in the last uh, couple of years uh, prior to this incident. So we wanted to make sure that in addition to their, their basic training, they, they had some, some, you know, just some fundamental stuff that they needed to know. And then one of those slides uh, on, on that presentation um, was obviously when, when you're on a roof, operating on a roof in smoke, smoke conditions and you can't see your feet, then you get down on your hands and knees. And that's what triggered the, the firefighter from, from Ladder 27. It, you know, it brought it back to him. He did what he had to do. He saved the, you know, uh, his company, uh, a group of younger guys that are younger than, than he, uh, less experienced than he. And uh, you know, he, he, without a doubt, saved the entire you know, company from, from, uh, from peril. Um, and again, the irony in this is that, is that Mike was one of the, uh, the instructors that we had going around uh, you know, doing this. Um, so, you know, that is, it's kind of sad that that was even a factor in it, you know. Um, any changes implemented in the agency uh, based on this incident? Uh, not based on this incident. Obviously, there's a NIOSH recommendation, you know, uh, regarding, you know, uh, communications. Uh, so we basically went back to basics again. You know, we, we, we uh, kind of emphasized you know, situational awareness, uh, engine uh, ladder, uh, uh, engine and ladder operations, mayday operations, uh, things of that. Uh, you know, at that time, you know, it was, it kind of just fell right into place for us that we were going through an, an AFG uh, program where we did a command and in, in, uh, in, uh, in leadership course. So that kind of, on, on the end of this, it kind of, the timing was just right where we were able to implement that. Excellent. Did the department itself suffer any confidence issues? And if so, how'd you, how'd you regain that confidence? You know, I don't think the department as a whole uh, suffered a confidence thing, but I think with, with line of duty deaths, what, what, what I've noticed uh, is that there's, there, for some individuals, there becomes a sense of risk aversion. You know, uh, uh, and I had one, one chief tell me after this job, he said, I'm not putting anybody up on the roof anymore. Well, you know, that's not the answer. You know, we still have to, to operate, you know, as, as, as professionals. We still have to take the, the reasonable risk to save, you know, save whole lives and property. Um, so I think that's what, what you know, what, what you get there. Uh, some folks think that if they don't commit people to, uh, to, to dangerous situations, then everything will be fine, you know, but that's not, that's not how we operate. And, and that's, and that's what, again, what we try to stress, you know, trust your experience, trust your knowledge and, 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 and you know, go with there when you make your decisions on the fire ground. What, what did you experience personally in the aftermath of the incident? Um, you know, when they talk about all these emotions you go through, well, I think I went through all of those emotions. You know, there was a sadness, anger, disbelief, you know, all, all those things you go through, confusion. Um, but, but, you know, the, 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 the biggest thing that, that for me, um, you know, I thought I prepared myself for this. Uh, you know, 20 fire deaths that occurred in, 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 in the city of Philadelphia. Um, from the time I joined in 85 up until Mike's uh, incident. Um, so it's not a matter of, of uh, you know, if it's going to happen to someone, it's a, who, who's it going to happen to, who's, who's going to be the IC when it, when it happens. So, um, you know, I tried to do a little preparation with that, and I saw the aftermath of some other jobs with some other chiefs, you know, uh, namely the Meridian Fire is the one that triggered me that as I advanced, that would be in my best interest to, to prepare myself for this should it occur. Uh, so I became my worst critic after a job. I would, you know, what did I miss? I'd come back and I'd review everything on every job from, from being a, a young acting chief right up until, you know, this very day. So, um, you know, I thought I was prepared professionally, uh, um, you know, intellectually, but what I wasn't prepared for was the emotional part of this at the end. You know, my first meeting with, with Kelly Goodwin was to, was to, to, you know, an offer of condolence for her, her son. I mean, her husband, you know, dying on, on, on my fire ground. You know, it's, it's a meeting uh, that you can prepare yourself for. Um, it's not a regular meeting that you meet anybody else. You can't say, hello, how you're doing? You know, your first expression is an expression of condolence to, to there. And I saw uh, Dorothy and, and, and Mike Jr. there. And it was just, you know, that was something that, you know, I didn't put it into the equation and, and I don't think anybody can prepare themselves for that, but I, I never 
look that far into it when I was doing all this pre preparation, you know. What kind of resources, uh, one of the questions we got, what kind of resources did the department deploy to assist uh, yourself and other members uh, to deal with it? We have, uh, uh, you know, our own internal, uh, you know, CISD team, um, uh, our EAP is, is, is on, on the scene with that. Uh, we have a, a process in place for that. Uh, even, even with the family, you know, we have a uh, family liaison assigned right off the bat. So our resources are kind of built in. Uh, again, sadly, we, we've experienced this enough over the years where we have policies and procedures that are automatically triggered when, when events like this occur. So those resources are constantly uh, available to us. What about, uh, you know, as an incident commander, uh, did you have a hard time getting back in the seat uh, for, for the next fires and how did you deal with that? No, uh, actually I, I didn't. Like I said, I went through that, that probably 24 to 48 hour period where I was, you know, reviewing, you know, what I did, well, you know, I do things differently. And, and, and again, like I said, I, I'm, I've been my, my worst critic uh, through all of this. So I just, you know, trust my knowledge and experience. Like I said, I was a chief a long time and I was an acting chief for seven years before that. Um, so it wasn't a matter of a loss of confidence or getting back into the, into the saddle. It just made me uh, more conscious of making safety a priority, if you will. You know, you, you do it, you say it, um, but your eyes open wider. You start, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're looking and you're doing size ups, you're, you know, all those things I just mentioned in there, you, you kind of, you know, say, well, you know, how did I miss that there? And now you kind of, you know, look a little deeply, a little more deeply into things. And then your, your, your check boxes get bigger, you know, if you will, and, and, and you get more of them. Um, but, you know, that, that's pretty much how that, how that goes. And what advice would you give to officers and firefighters that have to deal with the loss of one of their own? Uh, you know, again, like I mentioned earlier, you, you know, if you're put in that position, take the position seriously, you know, realize that we, you know, we talk about bread and butter all the time. We, you know, the things that, that we go out and do, but those are the jobs that lead to, to line of duty deaths because our guard's down, you know, we, we think we're going to go in, knock it down, go home, you know, go back to the kitchen table. Um, so we talked about preparation, you know, take the, the role seriously. Uh, don't think that it can happen to you because nobody uh, uh, goes out any day expecting it to happen. So think that it can happen to you and hope that it doesn't, um, you know, prepare yourself uh, uh, again, professionally, academically, become your, 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 your worst critic, analyze your actions after every job, build on your, on your knowledge and skills, uh, trust your experience, but never let your guard down. Excellent. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Anything else you'd like to add? I know we're going to talk about a tribute here in a second. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we get to the tribute? Uh, no, I really can't. I can't think of anything else at this point. Thanks. Yeah. It was very comprehensive. De definitely appreciate the, the insight into that. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. We'll uh, pull up here the tribute and the dedication. Okay. There we go. All right. So this was... Uh, this was in 2016, our mural arts program in Philadelphia. Uh, they were commissioned to a lot of uh, uh, you know, murals around the city and, and they've gotten on board with, with the police and fire departments. And they've done some, some great murals around the city for our fallen uh, uh, police and firefighters. Uh, but this is a, one of Mike's old stations, Ladder 16, Engine 6 Ladder 16 station. Uh, so uh, it, was, it was a grand uh, dedication for this memorial. And if we go to the next slide, this kind of encompasses the whole thing. There's Michael on the wall, larger than life, you know, literally. Uh, and it shows his, uh, you know, dedication to his country. There's, he's in his Navy uniform there. So his dedication to his country, the fire department, his community, and his church. And, and that, you know, and that, it's all captured on that wall. Mike's life is, 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 you know, forever, you know, emblazoned on that wall inside of the firehouse. Excellent. Well, Chief, thank you very much for your, your time and your willingness to, to share and your insight. And there's tons of comments on this about just thanking you for your willingness to open up and share what's going on. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, uh, I'd just like to close out with uh, one, uh, share the screen again here, uh, program that we have. One of the, the, obviously Chief Wilkins was is involved with the uh, uh, supporting the incident commander uh, program we started last June. And one of the things that the, the cohort decided was 
an educational component was critical. Chief talked about his, his preparation for if this should ever happen, and that's what this program is released uh, about a month ago, I believe, or a little less than that. And it's on the Fire Hero Learning Network, FAHLN.net, and you can go there, and this When an LODD Occurs, Incident Commanders Speak. About a 60, 50, 60 minute program, and it has uh, four of our incident commanders in the cohort talking about what they experienced, that type of stuff, the different emotions, you know, dealing with the family and the department, uh, behavioral health aspect, all that kind of stuff. So strongly encourage you to log in. There's tons of great programs on the Fire Hero Learning Network, uh, but this is an outstanding one, especially for incident commanders and the people who want to be incident commanders. So again, Chief, thank you very much for uh, your time today. And, and Chief, Chief, if I could, you know, in closing, just, you know, I want to thank Kelly Goodwin for her support. You know, we were able to reach out to Kelly and she was very much on board with, with this getting out. And also the children, you know, Mike Jr. and Dorothy and, and Mike was instrumental. Mike Jr. was instrumental at that dedication, I think, with helping a lot of us move on. Uh, Mike spoke there uh, about his father and, and, you know, you could really you know, see the sense of, of, of pride that he had and how proud he was of his father. And, and what a great parent, you know, Mike was. So I want to thank the Goodwin family for their support in all this. Excellent. Thank you, Chief. Uh, and one more plug, October 22nd, the fourth Thursday in October, uh, we'll be talking to Chief Jim Price, Toledo, Ohio, on an incident in Toledo. So uh, we'll be joining again on the fourth Thursday in October. Uh, thank you all for joining. Truly appreciate uh, spending time with us and hope you all have a great day. Take care, thank Chief. You, Chief. Thank you.